G'day guys, welcome. It's Thursday and it's preview time on my blue heaven. Um, it's been a big couple of weeks. I'm on holidays, but I've been, as I said in previous episodes, as quick as a dog, but I'm, I'm nearly there. I'm feeling a lot better now. Um, but unfortunately the holidays are nearly over and I've got to go back to work next week, um, which has been, which been a bit of a bugger, but that's just the way the cookie crumbles. Before I get started, not only have I been crook, but we've, uh, we've acquired a kitten. Um, in bizarre circumstances, and I mean bizarre circumstances, it's been like a gift from God, this uh, this little kitten. Um, I'm out in the My Blue Heaven studio here. This is where I record a lot of my videos. This is a this is a bit of a granny flat, which is attached to the back of our house. Um, it's quite private. It's got a couple of bedrooms, bathroom, etc. This living area here. Um, it's out here at the moment. We've actually got four cats of our own, which are in the main house. Um, and we love our cats, we really do, which makes me a little bit of a softie, I know. We also love dogs, but there's something about cats which we really like and uh, we couldn't live without them. And out of nowhere, we've somehow acquired this, I reckon it's about a 12 week old kitten. Um, I'll actually go and show you him first. Now he's very, very timid and very scared still. And we've had him now for, oh, a little bit over two weeks. Um, he's starting to come around a little bit, but it's a, it's, it's a long, a long road with him. It is a him. Um, we've named him baby boy at the moment. Um, so this is the adventures of baby boy, our new kitten. Now, I'm not quite sure where we're going to keep him. I think it's unrealistic to have five cats in the, in the house, but we, were, we are going to keep him until someone will adopt him. Um, so I don't know if I want to get too attached to him, but given his nature um, and the fact that we are, we are working really hard with him, it's, it's very hard not to get attached to a pet. So I'm just going to take you over to Baby Boy. Now he's very, very hard to see. And I bought him this little, uh, this little cave, which he loves. Um, and I'm going to position this so you can actually see him. There he is in there. Okay, he loves his little, his little house. It's nice and warm in there. Um, but as I said, he's very timid, very timid, but. We just heard this meow about three weeks ago, like this screeching little meow that was sort of coming through our house. So we couldn't put a finger on where it was coming from, looking on the roof. And we look like any suburban area, there's, there's stray cats, not too many around our area. Most cats are kept inside, but we just couldn't, yeah, where the hell is this meowing coming from? Um, and then one of my sons came home after work um, his well, bedroom's here, he's coming out to his bedroom and he noticed this kitten was actually sunning itself on the uh, outdoor furniture just outside here. And as soon as it saw my son, it just, it just ran. It just ran really quickly under our house, a little hole where it just went under and that's where it's been living. Now, for the life of us, we've got no idea where it came from. Absolutely no idea, just a, just a solitary, eight week old kitten under your house. Um, anyway, we started feeding it. It was obviously very hungry and very scared and very cold. So we fed it for probably five or six days. And then we got in contact with the local adoption center, cat adoption center, who gave us a trapping cage. Um, and we trapped it very, very quickly. Um, and we brought it out here to the bungalow and we put it in the little bathroom area for the last, say, 10 days or so, but we weren't making a lot of progress with it. It was eating, um, we could pick it up, it would purr, but it was extremely frightened and very much extremely scared, so we weren't making a hell of a lot of process. So I bought it a little a little, uh, little house and we brought it out into this main area now, and it's, it's slowly, guys, it's slowly starting to come around, which is really nice to see. So I'll keep you up to date on the adventures of baby boy. Uh, anyway, interesting way to uh, to start the show. 
We've got a huge game ahead of us this Saturday night at Marvel Star. Well, when I say Saturday night, I'm calling it the Twilight Zone game. Um, given it is a Twilight game, and it sort of takes me back a little bit to a lot of the games we would play against the Western Bulldogs when we were crap. We would play this time slot generally on a Sunday. Um, yeah, and it brings back... Not great memories, um, some fond memories. We, we have always had uh, a pretty good rivalry with this mob, um, and it's gone either way, you know. Even when they were strong, we could sometimes upset them and vice versa. So, yeah, but I'm more thinking Twilight Zone, for those who are familiar with the show, uh, the Twilight Zone, just the unpredictability of this game more so in regards to what Western Bulldogs team fronts up. There's no doubt for me the difference between us and them is all around consistency. Um, and that's why we are going into this game looking at the, you know, looking at the odds. We're going in, wouldn't say red hot favourites, but strong favourites. But they are an extremely unpredictable football team and at their very best. Um, if it all clicks for them, they have the capabilities of winning this game. Um, just like the Giants did to us last week. And it's not, it's not dissimilar. And I take the latter at this stage of the year. I think it's, although it is relevant, um, we're sitting second and they're 11th on the ladder. It is somewhat irrelevant because... They are an extremely good side when they are on and they have a lot of weapons um, and they've got a midfield which is loaded and I mean really loaded. I'm calling it the loaded fries uh, midfield of the Western Bulldogs. It's got the it's got the chilli mints, it's got the grated cheese, it's got the spring onions, it's got everything on it if it all goes right. And like always, if you don't get that part of the game right and it starts with the contest, um, and it generally, throughout the game, the consistency of the contest and which team gets that right, and then the spread and the run on the outside, which I think they may have just a slight edge in that regard. Um, yeah, if we don't get that part of the game right, then this could be a real battle, and a real battle, I, uh, I think, that is on the cards. But as soon as our game finished against the Giants on um, last Saturday night, I was really quick to erase that, um, really quick to erase that. And I was thinking about this contest straight away. And I know I said in my preview before the Giants game that I had a feeling, a gut feeling that we would drop one of these games. I'm now, I'm now worried about this one. I am worried about this one because if they really turn up, and if they're on, what the Western Bulldogs do really well in their wins is they play a really solid brand of footy um, and a really exciting brand of footy for four quarters. Um, all their wins are strong wins um, and they're on from the opening bounce. They're not the type of team that sort of fall behind and then sort of get on a run. They, they pretty much, when they're on and they look like they're on, uh, they're very, very hard to stop. So... They are, though, very unpredictable. Um, and if we came out and steamrolled them, it wouldn't come as a huge surprise, just given the nature of who the Western Bulldogs are. So for me, the difference between these two teams, us and them, is just consistency. And we are the more consistent football team, and the latter proves that. But it is irrelevant, because like the Giants last week, who were sitting outside the top, the top eight, we just knew if it clicked for them that they were going to be a formidable opponent. Um, looking at the recent form, obviously both teams coming off really disappointing losses. Uh, they were smashed last week um, over in Adelaide, the Dogs. They were really disappointing. But if you go back before that, they were strong against North Melbourne, have really improved. They're going to be a tough opposition, uh, particularly at Marvel. And then they were far too good for Fremantle. They're in reasonable good form themselves. They smashed them 149 because they can score and score big. And they copped a, a rampaging Brisbane Lions on a Friday night at Marvel Stadium. That wasn't a great performance, but the Lions are in good form. But they beat Collingwood. 
at Marvel as well. So their form line is, is not bad. And we know our form line. We don't have to talk a lot about that. I mean, we, we're coming off a loss. And yeah, I think it's, it's a, in the scheme of things, um, the patch in that second and third quarter was really concerning. Um, the fact that we just couldn't get our hands on the, on the ball and it didn't appear to be a lot of resistance. And, and you would like to think that really strong teams with, with, with really good credentials um, and a mature team, which we are now, can at least stop that momentum somewhat, but we're unable to do that. But I suppose the positive was that we finished the game off um, quite strongly, although it didn't feel like, although it would have been an, a, a remarkable victory in the end, it didn't feel like that That even when we got within two goals that we were going to win that game. So I think, I think that the loss was just. Um, hopefully it's come at the right time for us. But... This is a this is a difficult task um, that we wait for on Saturday, um, and in the context of things, it's it's so important for both teams. Obviously, for them, they're outside the top eight, but for us, um, I spoke about motivation. Um, what better motivation there is for this football team than to be finishing up as high on the ladder? as we can to put ourselves in a really strong, and I mean a really strong position, uh, to be contending come September. Although I'm worried about this game, um, I just keep coming back to one thing, guys, and that is Patrick Cripps and his 200th game. And I know milestone games don't have a lot of weight on them, but this one, to me, does. Um, this isn't any old 200th game. I feel like he's been around a lot longer than 200 games. <laughs> I really do. It doesn't seem like a lot of football, but what this bloke has been through since we arrived at the football club back in, what was it, 2013, um, for the best part of a decade, he has liter literally and symbolically carried this club um, and he was one. He was our one beacon of light, um, our lighthouse, if you want to call it that. Through such a dark period, it was almost like we would always hang on to the fact that we had Patrick Cripps. We just knew that if we could eventually get our shit together, that it was going to be on the back of 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 him, not just him. The football club needed to get. Their, um, their, 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 their shit together. But for him to do what he's done through that period of time um, when the club was on its knees and I think he's a type of individual that would feel somewhat responsible for the club's plight, um, but he stuck around. He wanted to stick around to, to see it through. Um, and if we can't find that, just that extra percentage in this game when it gets really tough, um, to do it, and I know he wouldn't want the team to do it for him, there's a bigger picture for Patrick Cripps. Um, but if the other players within the team can't lift for him, then oh, I'd be... I'd be fucking extremely disappointed and very, very surprised um, if we lost this game. I really would. I would be really surprised if we're walking off at Marvel Stadium at 7 o'clock, 7.30 on Saturday night, Saturday night having our pants pulled down by the Western Bulldogs in Patrick Cripps' 200th game. I'd be dis bitterly disappointed. Anyway, let's have a look at the makeup of the teams because I'll start with the Western Bulldogs. <coughs> Excuse me. And they're probably going to have to potentially throw the magnets around a little bit. Losing Norton is is big. For me, it feels big. Um, it just puts a little bit more pressure on Jamara Ugal-Hagan. He's still very young. 
um, and Sam Darcy is very young. Both extremely capable, both really dangerous if they're on, but they're young, really young. And not having Aaron Norton there, the senior head who takes an exceptionally good defender to keep him in check, it does put a lot of pressure on those youngsters to really step up. Um, so it'll be interesting to see what they do with Roy Relob. It's been a, a small success we shift him in back. There could be a tendency to throw him forward, but at the same time, time they've lost, lost the key position player in James O'Donnell. However, they will get uh, uh, Keith back, or they should get Keith back. Um, but do they take the risk in only having, say, a Buka Kamas and a Keith down back to keep Charlie and Harry in check? Not quite sure. I'd, I feel like Lobb will still start in defence, I really do, which will be interesting in itself, but Keith will come back, and he's a dour defender, a really dour defender. He's not a great defender, um, but he's someone who's got great concentration, um, and he'll do a job for the Western Bulldogs. And I'm really interested to see Rory Lobb as a defender. Will he go to Harry? I think he, if he does play, he'll go to Harry, and, and Keith will probably go to Charlie. They've got an, an exceptionally good running brigade down back, Bailey Williams and the other Bailey, Bailey Dale, um, is one of the best halfback um, players in the competition, particularly with his ball use. And I think he will need to be uh, stopped or tried to be stopped, whether that's a role for uh, a defensive half forward, Chincotta, uh, Fogarty, but Dale is dangerous. Um, Presses up really high, beautiful user, nice balance, kicks goals, um, and really dangerous. Coffield's come into this team, was a little bit yeah, a little bit up and down last week against Port Adelaide, so he's had a long, long layoff with injury. He's come across to the Western Bulldogs. It's not that I don't rate him because I think he showed a lot at St Kilda before he did his knee, but he's susceptible. Um, Taylor to raise just a solid citizen down back for them. So their back line is okay, but with no Liam Jones there, really the centrepiece of their of their back half might mean that they have to throw Buka Kamas down there as well, is it? who I think is an up-and-coming defender. But I like our chances on that Bulldogs defence, but they have been okay defensively. Um, yeah, I think their, their, their back line is somewhat underrated. Um, so it will be interesting if we if we can at least break even in the midfield because I just just looking at that feels like we could do some damage um, if it all clicks for us. Their strength, as I mentioned, is their midfield. Um, you know, oh, you know Bonton Pally. I mean, he. We talk about Patrick Cripps and what Cripp is able to do. And I don't want to talk about the leadership side of things because I think there's question marks on the Bulldogs and their inconsistency, inconsistency of energy and, and you don't want to call it effort, but the ability to get up week in, week out. And that could fall on really strong leadership. Um, but his ability to, to, to go forward and to, and to control the game and to have a huge influence on the game um, is so significant for them. And if he has a day out, that's that's significant problems for us. It's as simple as that. Um, and he almost feels like he's untaggable. Um, but it could be, it, it could be a role for, for Chincotta. It, it really could be. Libertore is the one. He's the one that does the grunt work inside with Ed Richards. And Ed Richards, I think that's been a revelation. I really do. I, 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 I look at Ed Richards, I spoke about him in a, in a video I did a couple of m months ago that we could have had this kid. Um, gone from a, a, a bit of a inconsistent halfback flank and to now being a bona fide midfield gun. He's got, he's got the strength on the inside and his breakaway speed and power and that left foot is really damaging. trelaw has been in super form, super consistent and yeah, that, that, that's a gun midfield, and you've got the, the youngster Riley Sanders and, and the veteran Jack McRae as well. I think Jack McRae's well past his best, I really do. Um, but it's, it's, it's a strong midfield brigade. And Tim English, um, he probably hasn't had the year he had last year, 
But what he does probably better than most ruckmen is he can drift forward and take a mark and he's a beautiful set shot for goal. So he will need to be watched as well. I think that will be a great battle in the ruck with him and uh, him and TDK, if that's the way we go. So that's the Western Bulldogs team. It is around, let, let's face it, it is around what they're able to do in the middle of the ground and whether they are on and whether we can whether we can have though, that defensive mindset um, to be able to be accountable for their strengths in there and really match them on the inside because um, that's where the game essentially essentially here at Marvel Stadium is going to be won or lost. Um, up forward, mention Darcy, mention Eugle Hagen if they can get off the chain. Riley West has been okay as a dangerous small forward. Uh, Latham Vandermeer is very, very quick, need to be watched. But our small defenders were a little bit down last week, but for the most part throughout the season, it's probably been a real strength of ours that our that we've finally found those those defenders who can, one, lock down and be really strong defensively, but also provide some offensive run as well. So that's the Western Bulldogs. Um, us, some question marks. I think um, I think it's okay to question. It really is when you put in a performance like that, which we did against the Giants, and now coming up in a really important game against the Western Bulldogs. It's okay to question, you know, certain players in, in specific positions. Um, and I'm meaning not only questioning their form, but also their durability, uh, what they took into last week's game. Are they underdone? Whether they're sore? That comes now down to really smart selection. Um, you know, what 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 does it look like for Jacob Wiedering? What does it look like for Mitch McGovern? What does it look like for TDK? What does it look like for Charlie Kerno? All players that played parts of last week saw. Um, it's one thing to make excuses for the drop off in the second and third quarters because these guys were sore. So we give them an out or a little out. Um, but if the four of them are pick, picked again. There's no outs this time. There's no outs. We cannot be picking players who are sore then going, okay, we shouldn't have done that. Um, okay, we start to then question selection. Um, we also start to question what the fuck's going on. So if all those four players are ready to go, um, they need to perform and need to perform strongly. Uh, the interesting one for me is probably Matthew Cottrell. Um, I think we... we Showed our cards last week. I think, obviously, Voss really likes him um, in, in what he offers to this team. I don't necessarily think we can play all of Ollie Hollands, Matthew Cottrell, Alex Chincotta, all in the one team at the moment. So I expect a change there. I think it may be Ollie. I think Ollie's form has been patchy. I didn't think he was the worst of our players last week, but he's the one that could probably go out of this team, although his running ability on Marvel Stadium could be really important. But Matthew Cottrell, I think, could go to a wing and play that role, um, meaning we could potentially bring in a Cunningham. who was in exceptional form in the twos last week. He can provide that real spark across half forward, that real clean ball use, um, a clinical finisher at times. I think it's a last chance for, for David Cunningham if he does get a shot. I expect Fantasia to go out of this team and be replaced by Motlop. I think it's time that Motlop comes in. I think four, five weeks in the VFL um, is enough to get the body right. I think he's a, he's a really important part of this team as shown in the finals last year. Um, I think any small forward are going to have those gains where they don't hit the scoreboard, but he offers this team something which the other small forwards don't, and that is that is ex excitement and class and some X factor. And I think for the most part that has been just missing uh, throughout the course of the year. Although our small forwards have been okay, I think the the defensive acts and the defensive pressure was down last week. That needs to lift, and that needs to lift a lot. I think if we can put that dogs back line under some serious heat, that will definitely help. But I expect uh, Fantasia to go out of the team and go back to the VFL. The big one, the big talking point, I suppose, is what we do with the rucks. 
TDK's numbers were superb last week, but in the middle part of that game, Briggs certainly did, 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 did get on top of him and, and really threw him around. I don't expect uh, Tim English to be doing the same to TDK, but we definitely looked a little bit it's a little bit toothless and a little bit short when when TDK was off the ground and Weathering was off the ground. Um, and the fact of the matter is, Mark Pitnett is in exceptional form in the VFL. Um, and I would not be surprised at all to see him come in and we would play two rucks for the first time in a long time um, to see what that looks like. I'd love to see Hewitt come back into the team. Not quite sure who goes out. I feel like we are... Potentially one midfielder short or one quality midfielder, um, midfielder short in a game which is going to be stacked with quality midfielders. And I've already spoken about that in regards to the Western Bulldogs. I'm not going to lie. I'm not going to lie. I'm worried. Um, I will finish off by saying this, guys. Um, Mark Robinson said some words during the week on AFL 360. Um the, I'll paraphrase it. He basically said that we've achieved nothing yet. Um, and and it got a lot of supporters triggered. Um, that's okay. I mean, you can be triggered. You can be upset. You can fight back. Um, but I'll do, I will say that. This is something that I said a couple of weeks back now. We are that team. We are that team who is consistent. We are that team has got good leadership. We are that team that got gears and can be damaging and build up consistency. But we're also a team that hasn't achieved anything yet. And remember one thing. If you want validation as a supporter, you're not going to get that off the media. You're not going to get that off of opposition fans. You're not even going to get that off me. Okay, You're only going to get validation off our team, off our club, and that comes through performance. Now, I've got no problems with what Mark Roberts had said because it was pretty much spot on. Yes, we've achieved something. We've put ourselves in a really strong position. But it's still all in front of us. And that's the way it's going to be until we're holding number 17 up. That's the way it's got to be. We're always going to have question marks on us, okay, when we start to dip and not perform. And that's just the nature of football. So if you don't like it, okay, I suggest you switch off social media and just enjoy the football. Anyway, speak soon.